All right, welcome everyone to the first chapter in our textbook. This is our chapter where we're looking at fundamental concepts to help you deepen your understanding of leadership and the role of communication. Because it's our first chapter, I'm also going to point out a few things that will help you as you go through the class and know what to expect. First off, you're going to see these, the beginning and end of each chapter lecture. Uh, these are meant to help you in several ways. You're going to hopefully be able to use them to keep you focused on the lecture. I know you're watching a lot of online videos right now, but these study guide questions will give you what you should be looking out for. Uh, I'm not always going to cover every single topic on here. Occasionally you'll see something where it will say, let's say box 1.1 right there, and box 1.1 might not be on a slide because you've got it in your book and I'm not going to sit here and read the book out loud. You've already been through it. Uh, second, after you've read these, here's my recommendation. Go back to the questions and see if you can answer them. You will have done the chapter reading, the quiz, you've seen my video. Can you answer these questions? If you can't, go back and find the answers. If you can, write them all down. These will form the study guide that you will then use and have for your test, which is open notes. But these are just open your notes. Um, I'm sort of expecting you not to just be giving notes to other people. Uh, so this is for you to create a guide for you so that you can do well on the upcoming tests. So let's start off with talking about why you should care about leadership. It's a highly sought after trait. Uh, companies want people with leadership abilities. You're going to find a lot of leadership research. And there's a lot of different approaches and theories about leadership in this class. In this class, we're going to incorporate that research throughout the semester to get a good idea of what competent research and um, competent leadership is going to look like. A couple things here. The chapter is going to look at different ways of looking at leadership. And then the chapters after this are going to follow up on the introduced concepts here. And leadership demands are placed on individuals who are leaders. So if you are finding that people are asking you to take these roles, usually there's a reason for that. Uh, so it is a really important thing to understand the entire process. All right, so let's talk then about what is leadership. If I ask each of you to give me a definition, there's going to be, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 different answers. Some overlap. Uh, in fact, there was a research study in 1991 where they found 221 different definitions of leadership. I'm going to guess that number now is probably in the 600s. It would be a really great little research project for grad school if anybody's headed there. Uh, leadership is complex, lots of different dimensions, and self-help books and gurus often will treat this like it's a really simple topic. But there's no set perfect definition, and one of the things that we've seen with developing this class and with focusing on how to teach you about advanced communication techniques is that leadership communication is a really great way for you to start to understand how you can improve your performance and just your career overall. So let's start where the textbook does, and that is six conceptualizations or themes, classifications, and lots of different terms here, of leadership. So your personal approach to leadership is strongly influenced by your definition and beliefs about leadership. Self-assessment one is going to help you think about where you're at now. And I'm going to recommend at the end of the semester you go take it again as you think through all of these topics. And I'm going to guess your answers are going to change. So use the self-assessment this time to get a feel of where you're at. Here are the six conceptualizations. I'm not going to go into too much depth as the book covers them pretty well, but this should be a good refresher of what was in there. Viewing leadership as a trait means you see leadership as a natural aspect of a person. They're going to be a born leader. Uh, so when you say leadership is a trait, it means each individual has these certain qualities. It's just the, that's them. Uh, it places a lot of emphasis on the leader and the leader's specific gifts. Uh, with this conceptualization, it means that leadership traits are innate. They're not something you learn. A self-help book really isn't going to help you here at all. The next way that they talk about it is leadership is an ability. This conceptualization is a little murky in the book, um, but usually leadership research distinguishes clearly between trait and skill. Leadership is an ability that falls between those two, and it's really not as discussed as much. The basic idea is that you can have the ability to lead either by having a natural capacity or by acquiring it. Uh, so let's think about music. If you view musical skill as a trait, you're talking about the person who, um, I play piano. So say I play a song on the piano and then somebody overhears it and they never played piano before, they've never taken a lesson, but they sit down and they pick out the notes and of course I'm irritated because <laughs> it, that's not my natural ability. I've had to practice and learn and study. 
uh, or my natural trait either. So if you think about it as ability, it means they have this natural tendency to understand music or play the piano, but they get better through practice. And if you look at his skill, um, this is kind of where my piano stuff leans, is more focused on how you learn to develop your piano playing competence. Uh, so I have a little bit of ability. Maybe I have some innate traits where perhaps hearing notes and being able to hear it since not everybody can. Um, but with competency, with skills, I've learned these fundamentals of reading music, understanding chords, how the notes relate together in the circle of fifths, not my favorite thing. Uh, and that knowledge is going to combine with practice to make somebody with an ability a better player. Leadership is a skill, again, is a competency developed to accomplish a task effectively and efficiently. Uh, with, the comp with this conceptualization, Leadership can be learned, it can be developed, it can be something where they can put you into a leadership training program and you're going to get better. So you learn how to delegate, to connect with people, to get things accomplished. Uh, those are skills that you are developing. Leadership can also be seen um, sometimes in research as a behavior. Uh, so that means it's conceptualizing leadership as an action. This perspective is different from the first three because we can actually observe behaviors, what people do in different situations. Uh, chapter four, going to go way into depth on that. Leadership as a relationship, I think, is one that's really trendy right now, um, and it's for good reason. Uh, this is viewing leadership as a process of collaboration between leaders and followers. Leadership is going to be interactive. I communicate with the people I supervise, and I want them to communicate back with me. I want them to take, later we'll talk about a democratic approach to this. Um, it highlights how followers play a role and stresses that leaders have to work with their followers. Uh, it's not like I can just walk in and be like, aha, here's my proclamation and people are going to get it. Um, there's this ethical overtone where they need to trust me and be interactive with me. Uh, the next one is leadership as an, in, oops, let me go through here. Leadership as an influence process. Uh, so this means you're going to influence the group to achieve a common goal. And it's an interactive event between the leaders and followers, and it is going to be another one where it's leadership as a learned thing that you can do. So there's a lot going on here, right? <laughs> uh, leadership is complex. There's just six different conceptualizations. I went really past because it goes into so much detail. Those uh, C's that are in the book, which are really interesting, where they talk more about how to conceptualize one of those specific ones. And all of these different ways of looking at leadership have contributed to the way um, leadership research is done. But how do you view your leadership? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, no perfect definition. Uh, these are two that are really good that we're, I want you to think about. The textbook actually defines leadership as a mutual influence process involving both leaders and followers. So that means in every leadership situation, there's expectations and demands placed upon one or more individuals to initiate and take responsibility for a decision, event, or other need. Johnson and Hackman, really important scholars, I'll reference them more than once. Uh, this semester. So they define leadership as human symbolic communication that modifies the attitudes and behaviors of others in order to meet shared group goals and needs. Both definitions have some similar um, aspects. Uh, so they both see leadership as a process, um, just like we. So this is where we're going to get back to communication, but communication is a process. It's not some trait or characteristic, but a transactional event. It is an interactive thing where you cannot just, again, walk in I always think of King George and Hamilton, if you've seen that, where he just walks in with the pro proclamation and then walks out. That's not leadership, that's a proclamation. Uh, that also lacks influence. Uh, so it's concerned with how a leader impacts the followers and the communication occurring between them. It occurs in groups. It's the context where the leadership occurs and it involves common goals because there's going to be a mutual purpose. This mutual goal is where we see ethics come into play. Uh, mutuality it lessens the possibility that leaders will act in a forced and unethical way. You've got accountability. This quote um, from the founder of the Container Store, it just sums it up so nicely. Uh, leadership is not something you do to people, but rather something you do with people. And since that's how we're viewing leadership, that's how we can work on this class and getting better with your leadership communication. 
As I mentioned, leadership and communication are processes. Well, what are the other connections? <laughs> In fact, if you notice, or I should have said this on the first day, the North House author is a communication scholar. So this is a part of our leadership research field. Leadership is best understood from a communication standpoint. That is sort of our key thing here in the class. Uh, there's two well-known researchers, Gail Fairhurst and Robert Saar. Uh, they explain that effective leaders use language as their most tangible tool for achieving desired outcomes. And what you probably learned in your previous BCom class is that that process of using language to achieving desired outcomes is something you can get better at. You're going to be, I'm sure, better now than, let's say, writing an email than you were when you were a freshman um, starting off in your first classes. In your previous BCom class, uh, you should have also learned that communication is a symbolic process, uh, that's the way I've taught it, and that meaning is generated through communication. Here's a visual of that process. The words I say to you right now are interpreted from your lens. Uh, that's your background, your previous experience, your interest level, maybe what you think of me, and you're thinking about how you're interpreting this message. And um, let's say, again, with just the me as the speaker, if you've had it with me or had a class with me before, you're probably interpreting some of this a little bit differently than if it's your first class with me. So if you've had a class with me before, you kind of understand how I teach. You probably trust me. You signed up for me for a reason. And you know how I communicate or how I might respond or communicate about an error. Let's say something goes wrong in e-learning. You know what's going well, you, you kind of know what I'm going to do and probably how I'll react. Pretty calm. Uh, so if you've not had a class with me, you don't know that. You don't know when I say guided, the study guide questions are going to be the stuff on the test, like, is that true? Is she just saying that? Um, but if you know me, you kind of have an idea. If you don't know me, you're putting me in a wider context with other professors you've had in JSOM or maybe another professor you had for business communication at a lower level and evaluating it from a different perspective. Uh, that means my message can be the same, but based upon how you are processing it, you're going to perhaps come away with a different meaning. And that's something where le a good leader who is a communicator is going to understand that. Quick review on communication. Uh, communication, we view it in um, our program as a process, not a thing. We view it as circular, simultaneous, continuous. Uh, if you had my previous class, I w showed you slides with things like the transactional model of communication, where communication is a straight line. Uh, so like a telegram or a text out to a massive group where there's no way to reply. Like that's transactional, dumping it out there. Uh, we see communication as complex, then that involves a more than one person, multiple levels across lots of different channels and a negotiation of shared meaning. We also tend to view communication as irreversible. So there's not take backs. Words are going to influence relationships. They're going to be something that can be brought in for let's say a court case. We'll look at that in chapter two. You can't uncommunicate. And finally, with communication, it involves the total personality. So you can't just say this person communicates like this, but really they're a nice, <laughs> I was thinking about those texts sometimes you see online where like it's the rude person in the relationship and the other person's like, but they're a nice person. They just talk like that. I mean, ultimately you can't really separate that communication from the person and that's in a relationship or at work. So let's then go into this slide. Um, so that is that, uh, as in communication, language and symbols matter in leadership too. Think about if you go in, and this is in communication, that is leadership, and labeling somebody as lazy versus motivated. Um, this can lead to different performance expectations, assigned tasks, career path, communication approaches, evaluations, and behavior. Leaders communicate about the past, the present, and the future, and they're using symbols to create reality and communicate a vision. So they make conscious use of symbols to re reach their goals. Good leaders, they're gonna understand that the followers matter here and how they interact with them is going to lead to hopefully good communication. Good leaders understand the value of things like storytelling, emotional communication competency, and impression management. And we're gonna be learning about that in this class. Let me just, I'll pause for there for a second and give you an example. So I manage a team now of professors. So if I show up, and I've seen uh, other people do this too, but when I show up in a suit jacket, even if let's say I just took my sweater that I'm wearing right now and put a jacket over it, um, 
maybe put a little extra red lipstick on or something. Uh, sometimes people will just kind of snap to the fact, oh, Sarah has made that symbolic choice to, to be the leader in the suit jacket, and I know how shallow that sounds. Um, versus if I show up in a sweatshirt and I've come straight from an exercise class, if I could go to them live, <laughs> it's going to be a different impression. And part of that is emotional communication competency, understanding the expectations of the people who are following you, how little choices you can make are going to influence what they think you're saying, even if you know, well, gosh, that's kind of shallow that they judge me on whether or not I'm wearing a blazer. So let's pause and think for a second, um, stop talking about myself, um, and think about it, uh, a leader you've had. What kind of stories do they tell? Uh, do certain stories stick out? What are the most and least effective? Stories can tell a lot about a leader's own background, their biases, their expectation, and their culture. So these can be really effective, but also you can kind of lead you down a path maybe you don't want to go in a workplace. And they can also illustrate the culture of the company and alert you to the norms and expectations of the company. Uh, so I've seen this in um, academic groups where people will tell stories about students. And that person who's coming in and telling stories about, oh, I can't believe my student did this while they were on Teams, like nobody wants to hear that. It's a FERPA violation. It's negative, even let's say they stripped it of all personal data, it's still just annoying. On the other hand, you have somebody who's coming in and leading with positive stories. That's a way to influence the culture and actually lead versus just dump. <laughs> Uh, the other way that you can think about that is to think about your follower roles and then your leadership roles. Uh, this is something just to sort of to be thinking about as we go through the class. Uh, what do you appreciate and dislike? What behaviors and qualities are you looking for? And what have you learned in the past, even if it could be a group that you were in or in a workplace? All right. The other thing that you could do here if you want, totally optional, um, just if you want to pause and <laughs> do something else, uh, is to do this activity. So if you're interested, you're welcome to pause it and then um, section that out. All right, so let's then move on with some of the content. Um, love this quote right here. Um, so we're going to shift gears and think about leadership versus management because this is an area where people sometimes get confused. You manage things, but with people, you should be leading. And you don't need to be the manager to be the leader. Um, people can conflate management and leadership. Uh, they're distinct. First, leadership studies can be traced back to Aristotle. Um, so management, came, management as a theory really came about in the early 20th century with industrialization. Management aimed to structure and coordinate various functions within organizations. Then managers figured out how to do things. Workers did those things. Managers monitored them. That was the moment where we started you know, having clocks in factories, performance factors, and lots of penalties. So Bernard um, conceptualized of really two types of authority. Um, that would be authority of position, is also kind of called assigned leadership, which is the power to direct the work of an individual by someone in a higher position in an organization structure. Authority of leadership, also called emergent leadership, is ascribed to those in the organization that have the knowledge and ability needed for a task. It's not assigned through position, it emerges through interactions communication with others who then come to trust and view you with as a leader. You might have studied this in OBHR, so if it sounds familiar, I'm super excited. Um, so think about the authority concepts. This is really like an OBHR pop quiz here. Uh, in French and Raven's Bases of Social Power Research, as uh, some managers have power from their position. Um, so hoping this is familiar, but legitimate reward, coercive information. Leaderships and leaders have personal power that's referent or expert. So let's look at that on a slide here. Um, so again, hopefully this is a little bit of a refresh, uh, but the big idea here is that both management and leadership involve influence, but leadership is about seeking constructive change. Management is typically about establishing order. So you can have somebody who's a manager who's not really acting as a leader. Uh, I'm going to guess if you've had a job, you have seen that. Uh, similarly, an employee can adopt a leadership role without an official management position or title. I work with someone who is just the dearest employee I have because she absolutely takes on a leadership role. She is not interested in the formal leadership position, but she is always influencing. She is always coming forward with positive, constructive ideas. Um, that's power. It's power, but it's a sort of ethical, legitimate 
rewarding um, relationship and interaction. Let me give you this in one other way. So John Cotter, um, author of A Force for Change, How Leadership Differs from Management, he says to think about agendas when determining the difference between leaders and managers. Uh, so for example, uh, you're creating an agenda, managers are going to focus on planning, budgeting. Leaders are going to be focused on direction, long range view, big picture, what are the major concepts that we need to understand. So when you're developing a human network for achieving an agenda, managers are going to mobilize through organizing, through staffing, through putting the clock on the wall. <laughs> so don't go back in time. Uh, now leaders are going to mobilize because they're going to align people. They're going to focus on integration, on teamwork, on commitment, on, for me, one thing I, I've tried to do is look at people's skills and think, how can I help them achieve their goals or enhance those skills? Um, yeah, I'm doing some management tasks where I'm doing the schedule, but that's not the only thing I do. That wouldn't really make me a leader. In executing an agenda, managers are going to control and problem solve, which is awesome, but leaders are also going to motivate and inspire. Uh, so for example, I had an issue <laughs> last week with the schedule and um, how that was going and work class sizes or some little things that ha happened. First off, I'm going to try and control and problem solve the relationship based or problem solve the issue based on the relationships I have established with people in JSOM. But then when I took it to the people it was affecting, I wanted to motivate them that the semester was going to go well, that they're doing a great job. Um, that's the difference between just managing or also trying to focus on leading a team in an effective way. And just hearing me say that, you can think back to those earlier conceptualizations of leadership. That wasn't just something that was an innate thing for me. Uh, that was something where I, I had to think, well, yes, here's what's happening, but I'm worried about the outcomes and I can improve the outcomes by looking at the relationship. So Cotter, going back to the author of that book, he says that management produces orderly results, but leadership re leads to useful change. And both of those, super important to an organization. Do you want to add one more thing in here? Um, so we've talked about that already. And that is that in North House, it does a really good job talking about global leadership attributes. Um, there's concepts in there from this chapter are often from a North American perspective, but there's other ways to look at that. So I will come back to that this semester. Do know that there are these aspects that are global and there are also going to be aspects that are going to be specific uh, to your culture, to your region, to just how people see you because of a lot of different reasons. So know that these seven C's are a fantastic thing to learn. Um, you kind of remember on the lecture notes it said it wasn't the most important thing from the chapter. All right, and next, this will be easy to remember for those of you who have uh, seen Star Wars, I'm gonna guess most of you, um, but that is the dark side of leadership. We're going to actually end the semester with this. <laughs> And this is going to be thinking about the destructive practices of leadership. And yes, this did come out after Star Wars, so there is <laughs> some purpose. Uh, in some ways, it'll probably make it easier to think about in this class. We're thinking about the light side and the dark side. All right, so if you're going to picture a leader right now, I'm guessing most of you are thinking Darth Vader, but you might also think about someone like, I don't know, Voldemort, or maybe you think, I thought of somebody who's real, who's a destructive leader like Hitler. So think about this person. So maybe you've got, I don't know, Darth Vader in mind. <laughs> and uh, as we'll go through a couple of characteristics. Uh, so the dark side of leadership is going to be this destructive side of leadership where a leader uses his or her influence or power for personal ends or other unethical things, um, like money, for example. It's going to be characterized by toxicity. And it, let me back up there. It doesn't have to be money. Sometimes people will just do this for reasons of power or personal satisfaction. Um, if you are particularly a person who is focused on ethics, maybe because of your religious background, maybe because of that's just how you have come to be as an adult, this might not make a ton of sense to you, and that's okay. Um, this is something where it's useful to understand and maybe have empathy or, or understand at least the differences that are going to influence both leadership and then how people communicate to you. So there's complete aside from my notes. Um, but let me go back. So leaders that are toxic, that means their leadership is leaving their followers worse off than they found them. Sometimes this will violate the basic human rights. Um, if you are thinking Hitler, you're, that's really obvious. And often playing into their followers' basic fears. So a lot of people maybe thought Hitler here. <laughs> so it's a prime example of the dark side of leadership. There's other examples, um, thinking of uh, different world 
not trying to be political, but different world leaders um, outside of the United States where leadership has led to violent civil war. I'm thinking of Syria where there was a ton of people who died. There's religious extremist groups. Or um, one thing that I kept thinking of is cult leaders, um, particularly because I was thinking of, I'm thinking like David Koresh um, was so charismatic uh, in Waco, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, but his charismaticness led to incredible destruction and loss. All right, so this book commissions leaders committing murders, um, but oh my gosh, that's not quite where we're, we're going to go with this. Um, destructive leadership can arise from leaders being selfish, incompetent, rigid, unyielding, callous, corrupt, or maybe insular. Uh, it can be making cognitive errors like bad judgment calls or due to environmental factors, like perhaps they aren't managed well by the person supervising them. Sometimes they're just bad people. What does that look like in the workplace? Well, maybe it's you work for a supervisor who uh, decides they dislike what you said in a meeting. So the next year you're given the worst possible schedule or assignments, or they decide they aren't happy with some other thing, or maybe they're just in a mood. And so they take away a project that you really like because they want it for themselves. Uh, another example, we'll look in the next chapter, I'll talk about Elizabeth Holmes, some of my favorite examples of unethical and destructive leadership at um, Theranos, it's a blood testing company. And it was bad judgment calls. It was really the pursuit of power, of recognition, of money. Um, that doesn't mean this person is just plain evil or can't change, but it does happen in the workplace. My perspective at this point in my career is that bad leaders can be removed if top leaders are supportive. You just need to be careful um, when you're selecting a company to really examine what is the culture um, as you go into it. All right, so as promised, here are the study guide questions again. That kind of wraps up our chapter where we looked at all six major conceptualizations of leadership. We talked about trait, ability, behavior, skill, relationship, and influence. I showed you really quickly that seven C's. You're welcome to scroll back and pause on that. It's interesting. It's, it's in your book, and you did a knowledge check on it, so I'm not, um, yeah. You don't need to know that for the test. Uh, the second thing you do need to know for the test is the difference between um, sort of an approach and a theory in leadership communication research. So we talked a little bit about that as I went through. Uh, you'll want to understand how leadership starts to connect to communication. So I gave you a couple of examples of that, but that's something where you can go deeper on it. And I did really bluntly say the difference between leadership and management. Uh, so you can scroll back in the slides to that, or you can also look at some of the book content as well. All right, so that wraps up chapter one, which is all about the idea of the concept of leadership. Uh, chapter one, I know I'm going to guess this will be my longest lecture out of all the lecture videos and my goal for the others is to be short, but I wanted to set up and really explain to you what our concepts of leadership are going to look like, how that relates to communication and how this should build off of what you had in your last BCom class, but also what you probably took from things like global business and your OBHR courses.